Hello and welcome back to Jump To It for irishracing.com. In today's show, we're going to be going through our team's top anti-post picks for some of the big races at the 2022 Cheltenham Festival, as well as some tips for this upcoming weekend. Now it's time to bring in the team. So once again, I'm joined by Vincent Finnegan of irishracing.com and Ed Quigley. Now, Vincent, I want to start with you, give you some congratulations for finishing third in the Irish Fields tipping competition. Tell us how that went and talk us about the dramatic final day. Well, it's, uh, I finished third. I was a long, long way behind the winner. Um, but what basically happens in the Irish Fields and Apps table is all the journalists in Ireland pick a, one horse each Saturday uh, or Sunday. So it's a weekend tip. You just pick the one. If it wins, you go up by the SP. And if it loses, you go down one euro. So basically going into the last weekend of it, I, I tend to try and go for outsiders in it. I won it twice going back a few years ago. So I was you'd like to think you might win it a third time at some stage but i'm probably getting a bit long in the tooth to do it a third time but we'll see and um, so anyway going into the last weekend of it i was a few cent behind the guy in second and the leader was 19 euro ahead of me so it was going to take an outsider i had to go for a mad one to try and catch him so i went for a 33 to 1 chance didn't win and um, all the rest of the guys around me in the in the, in around the places they all trust um into second or third with short price horses but none of them won so I ended up staying in third, but with fair juice of the leader. The leader was 19 clear of me. He was still 19 clear a second as well. But rather than going for a short price one to consolidate his position, he he kicked on, hit an 18 to one winner on the last weekend. So he he won by a country mile. So fair juice to him, but it's nice to finish in the places again. It's a few quid for it as well, which isn't a bad thing. Well, of course, hopefully you bring us some more winners here on Jump to it as well. Ed, I want to bring you in as well. Happy New Year to you. Uh, just. To just to touch on as well, the racing over the Christmas period, any particular eye catches that stood out for you? Yeah, Happy New Year, Joe. Um, yeah, lots of action, wasn't there? Uh, I suppose naturally Shishkin with all the kind of hoo-ha of, you know, has he still got four legs if you really believed half the reports? <laughs> but uh, I mean, he absolutely, look, you can slice it whichever way you like, but he thumped the Tingle Creek winner, um, you know, give him an absolute pasting uh, for a horse, which, you know, reportedly Shishkin was 80% fit. Well, if that's the case, then uh, everyone's kind of struggling, aren't they? So, yeah, that was the kind of big standout uh, performer, but there were lots of other memorable performances and lots of horses for the notebooks. I, I think we covered them quite extensively on last week's show, rather Vincent did, you know, the the swarm and the, the kind of weight behind the Irish challenge uh, and that the class Irish acts at the moment is there for all to see. Uh, I think very quickly I, I was looking off air uh, going through the Cheltenham Festival grade one market. So I think there's two English trained favourites at the moment. And then there's a, there's a blanket of, uh, of, of Irish runners at the top of those anti-post lists. So yeah, it, it, lots of uh, exciting performances, but uh, yeah, the action in Ireland was where I think we really need to concentrate on in, in regards to going further forward. Now, there was some unsavoury incidents as well that came out of the racing. I want to just bring in Vincent here. That incident at Fairy House, the fan throwing the beer at the horse. And obviously, we condemn that kind of action here on Jump To It. But for you, Steve, uh, for you, Vincent, sorry, is this kind of indicative of what's going on? Or what's your take on the situation? Well, to be honest, it's, it's a one-off so far in Ireland. It's the first time we've ever had an incident of this type. But at the same time... You do start to see there's been a trend over the last few years, um, particularly at the UK racing, where there's been some high profile brawls and different things, a lot of drunken behavior. And you've had Cheltenham um, putting restrictions on at the festival where people could only buy four drinks at a time and this this type of thing going on because they've, they've seen it as an issue. It's an issue across society. It's not just at horse racing, but you, you tend to find that where people are out and they're drinking, there's going to be antisocial behavior. And it seems to be very prevalent everywhere, realistically, whether it's Ireland or the UK. And as we know, Ireland is a, is a country like the UK where there's a lot of drinking takes place. And you're always going to be susceptible to something like this happening. This is the first time something like this has happened at a race meeting in Ireland. And it could have been a serious incident. Admittedly, it was it looked like it was a plastic glass, which is what most people have at, at race meetings nowadays. That sort of stuff has been brought in at most outdoor venues. So it wasn't as bad as if they were throwing an actual glass at a horse. But at the same time, it could have easily spooked the horse, the jockey. It's a very dangerous thing. It's very disrespectful to the sport as well and something you, you really don't want to see. The question, I suppose, realistically around this is, what do the race courses now do? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how you deal with this. You would say the first idea is you'd move the, um, you'd move the spectators further away from the track probably the same around the parade rings, move them further back. But that, that kind of 
loses the whole feel of the, the meeting for for the real spectators who want to be as close to the action and the participants as they can. So I'm not quite sure what you do here. Maybe more security. We know it's only going to be on big days, a, a minor meeting in Turles on a Thursday. Basically, they're all pensioners. So there's, there isn't really going to be that sort of um, same same danger to the participants uh, on a day like that. But but at the same time, I think we have to look at the fact that this is something that is prevalent throughout society, and we're going to have to look at how to deal with it. One of the things that, that, that I feel personally, I'm not sure many would agree, and I don't know what the story is with Ed in the UK with this, but... In, our, in Ireland over the last few years, we've been trying to encourage younger people to go racing, particularly um, student days. They're huge, and they tend to be just a piss-up for third-level students. I have a daughter in Trinity College in Ireland at the minute. She's the same. She's absolutely no interest or no knowledge of horse racing, but yet she will go to one of these race days because all her student friends are all heading off. They're all getting dressed up, and they're all going drinking for the day. So... We've had these, and Limerick has, a, has been very successful with this over recent years. We've also got Leopardstown doing and the Curra did one there during the summer. You're talking about maybe 10,000 students turn up, and you think, oh, that's great for the sport. Isn't that fantastic? Huge amount of students now getting involved in horse racing, but they're not. That in Trinity College, where my daughter is, there's, a, there's hundreds of societies. There's a society for anything, and there's a horse racing society. But that horse racing society is tiny. It wouldn't have 50 active members in it. So same across all the other universities. So what are we dealing with here? It's the same as it ever was. There's a, there's a few kids coming through who have a, a real grow and an interest in horse racing, and they're the ones we want to support, I suppose, to come through. I don't think we want the other 10,000. They've no interest in it. All they're doing is coming for a day out on the piss. And uh, just to get your viewpoint on this as well, Ed, from the UK point of view, I mean, yeah, what can really change? Is it just these one-offs? Like We just need to discourage this kind of behaviour. Um, what more can be done? Well, absolutely. It's, it's, as I say, it's always kind of one bad apple, doesn't it? And then it all kind of goes off. And uh, well, thankfully, well, it seems to be the only instant we've seen of that nature in Ireland with a an actual drink being thrown at a moving horse on a race course. I mean, bizarre scenes, really, weren't they? Uh, over here, yeah. I mean, touch wood, it's, everything's been OK recently, but it was well documented last couple of years, weren't they? A big brawl at Ascot and Goodwood and a few unsavory moments. But uh, yeah, I, I agree a lot with what Vince is saying in terms of it's a kind of societal thing, isn't it? Naturally, it, you know, like that's why you have nightclub bouncers, don't you? Very, you put a load of people together in a confined area and you stick eight to ten pints in them and something's going to happen. I mean, it's it's life. It's not rocket science, to be honest with you. The, the bigger picture is, yeah, it, in terms of growing the sport, are you growing the sport or are you growing a, a glorified stag do? I suppose it, it, it's a fine balance, isn't there, between keeping you know the atmosphere and the gate receipts and, and, and keeping everything ticking over as opposed to it spilling over and it, it's a tricky one to be honest with you because you know race courses enjoy it uh, and, and a lot of people enjoy the the spectacle racing but when they feel there's a, a you know it's something untoward's going to happen then that's going to take the edge off the you know the aforementioned racing fans if you like and you almost don't want to go true draconian and start uh, you know uh, did someone on Twitter the other saying uh, everyone when they um, queue up at the door should be given a quiz? You know, who won the 2008 Potemps finals? You can't answer it. Sorry, you're not coming in. No. Um, yeah, in that case, then there'd be three people there, and one of them probably wouldn't be me because uh, my memory shot to bits. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a tricky, it's, it's, a, it's a delicate issue, I, I'd say, and it, it, it's which way you want to go. You know, you see it with the like the kind of darts crowds and everything. Uh, there were a few chants you talked to the other day, weren't they? The kind of Yah Yah Colo Torre chants and everyone jumping around. And the thing is, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's harmless fun. People are just are having fun. I don't begrudge that at all. But it's it's often the next step when it goes too far is that it does spill over into something. So to be honest with you, I'm often on here. I don't actually know what the answer is because the same you don't want to kind of put restrictions on the courses of society to the extent the same well, uh, only come in if you're interested in horse racing. Um, in the strictest sense, you'd be having 50 people through mm. the gates every time. So uh, whether that's a good thing, bad thing, I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one, but it, invariably, yeah, as you say, Vincent mentioned like the uh, uh, the, the side of the shores anyway, with the, the, the Cheltenham have put the, the wristbands on for you, you're limited to a certain amount of uh, drinks and things, but you know. You see things of people hiding booze in, in binoculars, which you can screw the top off. People, people will find a way, won't they? So I, I think it's a tricky issue. And um, yeah, what the answer is, I ultimately do not know.
No, but I think Fairy House did do a, a. They dealt with it well enough. They actually tweeted it after the incident, said they identified the perpetrator and then expelled them as well. So making an example of these people, making examples to show that that's not the right way that we want racing to be perceived. I think that's probably the way to go. But it does bring me on to the Cheltenham Festival because we are expected to have full capacity. COVID restrictions are kind of yeah. Hopefully they don't come into play this year. So yeah, it should be really exciting in terms of the numbers of crowd we're going to see and hopefully no kind of spiking cases afterwards. Uh, but that moves us on to some of the big races that we are going to look at here on Jump To It now from an anti-post perspective. So starting off with the champion chase, we are speaking off air. Looks to be a two horse contest really. But Ed, not long now. Uh, let's talk about it. The Shiskin and the, uh, yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, Shiskin and the worthy favourite for you. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, not lost a race over fences. He's the Arca winner. I um, mean, his comeback was spectacular, given that you could say, you know, he did beat the strongest of fields at Kempton, but he still absolutely swatted aside a Tingle Creek winner without really coming out of third gear. And, uh, you know, there was all this talk about, is he fit? Is the ground right? And it was his first start of the season as well. He's taken on race fit grade one rivals and he he's the horse they've got to beat. As you rightfully mentioned, Joe, there's this joker in the pack, if you like, uh, an Ergabine. We, I don't think we really know how good he is. That is the what makes it really exciting. You know, everything we've seen from him is breathtaking. And I just do hope, you know, we often get disappointed, don't we, by these matchups in racing. It, it, it never happens. Either neither of them will make the gig or one of them will get injured or they'll both get there and then uh, some, someone will unseat it the first or something stupid happens. But I've been saying this on this show for the last couple of months. Uh, if you could scrap every other race at the Charlotte Festival, just have the champion chase with these two going hammer and tongs, uh, I mean, it would be a sight to behold, wouldn't it? Because Anurgamin, I um, mean, he sets a furious gallop, doesn't he? Shishkin would like to travel in behind. And uh, just one thing I would like to add in, though, for more of a kind of technical point is with regards to Shishkin. Seems to be a lot of talk from the Henderson camp in terms of, oh, he needs good ground. I wonder if this is just some kind of false narrative that uh, maybe we kind of associate of all Nicky Henderson horses like strong travellers, like a decent service. But you actually look at the facts in the form book. Uh, Shishkin's very happy uh, with when the mud's flying. I mean, he won the Supreme on ground that was officially soft, heavy in places. Uh, he bolted up on his, his comeback at Kempton. I mean, it actually lashed it down for two days prior to that on officially soft ground. I mean, a few horses coming home legless there. And you could argue his most underwhelming performance was on the quickest ground he encountered at Aintree uh, uh, back in April. So I just wonder if that's a little bit of a red herring of all this ground talk with Shishkin. He's shown he's put in two of his career best performances uh, on the softest ground he's encountered. So I wouldn't necessarily, uh, if the market goes a little bit OTT and if we ended up with a, a softer, heavy ground chant or festival, uh, I don't necessarily see that as a problem for him, which would be the general perception it is. So whether uh, Shishkin and Urgamin clash forehand in the Clarence House chase or not, uh, I'm not sure. I'm sceptical. I'm always sceptical, Joe, as you know. I'm one of <laughs> neither of them will turn up in the contest, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, nonetheless, they look the two to be. Outside of that, uh, we were talking off air, just the final point, this could easily end up being a, a five, six runner field. I think a lot of trainers look at it and think, Look, I mean, the likes of Granatine have got to take their, their chance because they're, uh, you know, the Tingle Creek winner. I think New Bay Negra will run. But outside of that, uh, you could probably count on on two or three fingers, I think, realistic horses for the places. So it'd be a small field. It'd be a cracking spectacle. Um, I'll shut up now, but I'm, I'm just so excited about these two horses. Well, let's have your point of view then, Vincent, as well. You're going for Ergamine, going against Shiskin. So why is that? And how much do you think the Clarence House, if they do come together, how much will that have an impact on the champion chase? Well, a huge bearing, obviously, if they do, because there, there looks to be only two runners in this champion chase. It looks to be between the two of them. You've got the best of the Irish, the best of the English, and they're going to go head to head is the plan. And if, as Ed says, if we get that, it's going to be one of the races of the festival this year. The thing with Ergamine, Ergamine is um, ground versatile is the first thing. But the, the big question mark is only had one run in open company. Um, it missed the Arca last year, obviously, against Shishkin at the, at the 11th hour, more or less. So we're not quite sure what we're dealing with here. Every time, as, as Ed says, we see this horse on track, it looks an absolute machine, does everything right, wins easily. And according to the Willie Mullins camp, this is the best they've got. So when you're when you're dealing with that, you're having to say, this is this is some horse and Shishkin is going to have to be fully on his game to beat Ergamine. So what I'm looking at is the value at the moment. If the two of them do clash in the Clarence house on the 22nd of January, possibly unlikely it looks like the willie mullins camp have already put their stall out to say our horse runs in the clarence house 
possibly to give Nicky Henderson an option to say my horse doesn't ultimately and um, because he really won't want this clash um, before Cheltenham he'll want it at Cheltenham is, is the most likely so they, they put their stall out to say we're running the Clarence house that's most likely where he'll go and then you're looking at where does Shishkin go probably a week or two later there's plenty of other options in the UK for him to run in so he'll get a prep run somewhere they'll both most likely win the two preps and now we head to Cheltenham with them going head to head what I'm looking at is the the current odds. You're looking you can get as as big as five to two ergnamine, and that that's a hell of a price because on the day I can't see the horse being that price. And um, presuming everything goes according to plan with both of them in the meantime, obviously if they were to clash in that Clarence House, whichever one wins goes a short price for Cheltenham. But I don't think that clash is going to happen. I'd agree with Ed that one or both of them probably won't run there. And that the first time we're ever going to see them against each other is in Cheltenham, and it's going to be a fantastic spectacle. But again, as we say, there's only two runners. The rest of them aren't good enough. If one or both of these turns up and produces their best form, the others have no chance of beating them, realistically. So you're looking at it being a dead match, which is exciting stuff. Presumably, they both turn up. And just to point out as well, Stephen Harris can't be with us today, but he is also going for Shiskin as his top bet for the champion chase. But now we're going to move on to the Ryanair. Now, a bit more of an open contest. There's lots of entries here at the moment. Alaho, last year's winner, of course. Vincent, you're siding with him. Is that down purely just because we just don't know who is going to run at this stage? Not particularly, now I have to say. It's based on the fact that he was a very impressive winner of the race last year. Um, that's that's the first and foremost thing. His run in Punchestown, the John Durkin recently, wasn't that impressive. He, he didn't jump that well. He didn't beat them that convincingly. What was he, a two-leg winner from Janadil? Um, lots of other horses in that have run well since. We then boy Allen obviously was in behind that day. And um, the horses that that ran in the King George, the first and the other one, um, Asteria and Falange were both in behind while Asteria and Falange fell there and fell in the King George as well. But realistically, Alaho sets a fair standard and there doesn't look to be a clear second favourite in this. You've got horses like Envoy Allen, no reason why that would beat Alaho if it runs. You've got Fakir Dudares, was beaten 12 lengths mm -hmm. by Alaho in the same race last year, so no reason why that would be a change there either. Asteria and Falange, not certain to run here, I suppose, but at the same time, I'm not sure that horse jumps well enough to get around Cheltenham, certainly not at speed and in something like a Ryanair over two miles five or so. And then the one horse in it, maybe you'd give a chance to Shan Blue if it was to turn up. Um, was looking like an impressive winner early in the season when it took a heavy fall and then the combat going straight to Cheltenham. So maybe, but realistically, at the at this moment in time, it's very hard to see beyond the Lajo. If the horse turns up in the same form it did 12 months ago, it should win. So that's why I was edging in that direction. And then for you, don't, not, not to bring up the pain of Chamblou yet again, but for, the, for you and the Ryanair, you're going for a bit of an outsider, right? Well, yeah, look, I mean, Alaho's uh, claims are well advertised, weren't they? I mean, going through my memory, uh, I mean, he's one of the most just visually impressive winners of the Charter Festival I can remember for ages. I mean, there were 160 plus rated horses cooked uh, three out in that race in the Ryanair last season. I mean, he jumped them absolutely ragged. Only stag is... Maybe that has slightly taken the edge off him. We don't know. I mean, it was a little bit of an underwhelming run in the John Durkin and since he didn't travel with his usual verve and vigour, but we know he comes right in the spring, uh, etc. And look, he's the worthy favourite, but I, I was just looking for something as an each way kind of play. Something's got to fill the frames. And I think it's question marks about all of them in truth in behind him. Uh, I just thought El Dorado Allen was a horse who could run well at really huge prices. The Tizard camp have said all oh, year he's being targeted at the Ryanair chase. He's got an all roads lead to that. And often with anti-post markets, Joe, that's something which you like to get on side is nailing down the target. You know, there's a lot of horses of multiple entries at the festival where they could perhaps run the Gold Cup or the Ryanair or could go champ chase a Ryanair or even some of those rated in the 150s. They sometimes switch and go into one of the handicaps at the last minute. Uh, they're kind of making no bones about this. This horse is going for the Ryanair chase. And so I always like that on side, if you see what I'm saying, as a kind of insurance policy. And this horse has got some pretty decent form to his name as well. If you look at his Holden Gold Cup performance, he beat Hitman. Of course, that horse then finished runner-up in the Tingle Creek. You know, he's he's ten pounds, twelve pounds off being a, a champion in the Ryanair. But as I said, something's got to fill the places behind Alaho um, at, at this stage. And he, he's he's an unexposed horse. He's been trained for the race, and uh, yeah, I, I think he'll he'll run a really good race at thirty-three forty to one. And I wouldn't be shocked if he managed to sneak a, a sneak a place at those odds. It's a it's a bit of a muddy waters. Rather, I've got more convictions on the champion chase. I do think the Ryanair has a little bit of a muddled look to it. If, if Vincent says if you took Alaho out of it. 
uh, you, you could kind of throw a blanket over about 10 of them, couldn't you? And so for that reason, I'm just gone for one at a price who knows being aimed at the race. So El Dorado, Adam, for me, if he can finish at 18 lengths third to Alaho, I'll be uh, I'll be pretty happy. <laughs> And uh, I know Stephen as well is going for another outside pick. He's looking at Midnight Shadow to win it around the 33 to 1 mark. And of course, Bet365 now going non run and no bet on all of these feature races at the festival. All right, let's move on, chaps, to the big one the Gold Cup, of course. Manila Endo winning last year, denying album photos three peat. But how do we see this going, Vincent? I know you're siding with Galvin. So just take us through why that is and why do you think he can beat Aplutard? Well, well, the first thing here is we, we're talking about these three big races where there were entries out this week, the Champion Chase, the Ryanair, the Gold Cup. We're still not sure which horses will shuffle the pack and which ones run in each. Like you've got that Alaho is in all three races. Mm -hmm. Now we're presuming it's Ryanair because the horse won it last year, but it just goes to show like if William Mullins can't make a decision now, how the hell are we going to make one <laughs> ultimately to try and pick out what's winning? But, but at this moment in time, again, looking at the Gold Cup, for me, there's only four runners. You've got... The first three from last year, which is um, Manila Indo, a Plutard, Album Photo, they finished 24 lengths and further ahead of everything in the race last year. So the, they were streets ahead of everything else last year. Of the ones that were in behind, you had the likes of Champ Lost and Translation Santini, who were entered again this year, they all pulled up in it last year, beating a million miles. Um, so they don't contend, I don't think. And the only horse that's come through this year to possibly challenge that top three is Galvin. Um, this, the Savile's Chase run for me screams that the extra couple of furlongs in Cheltenham is right up the street. He won the four-miler at the track last year. He looks to be a hell of a horse. Gordon Elliott is more than capable of, of producing him to be at his absolute best on the day, which is all you really want with any of these. We're not certain at this moment in time. Manella Indo, there's a definite question mark about him um, on what he's done on the last couple of runs. You've got a Plutard is an obvious contender. But at the same time, he got beaten in the race last year by Manila Indo. So he can't be any certainty, no matter what way you look at it. And he got beaten by Galvin recently, admittedly. You could say he didn't get the greatest ride ever from Rachel, but I, I don't think it made a whole lot of difference. From, from a Gold Cup point of view, it made absolutely no difference. That what you saw visually in Leopardstown the last day is that give them an extra two furlongs up a hill, and there's no doubt Galvin beats a Plutard if they if they turn up in the exact same form they wear for the Savile's Chase, regardless of how either of them is ridden. So then the only other one for me in it is Album Photo. You have to respect this horse. Finished third in it last year, having won the previous two. They were two poor renewals, to be honest, that the horse won to win two gold cups. But having said that, went into the race last year and was backed on the day from 100 to 30 into 9 to 4 favourite probably public money for a horse going for the third right third win in the in the race but at the same time must have been well fancied from the mullins camp going in going into the gold cup last year wasn't beaten that far is beaten less than six lengths by manila indo and um, four and a bit lengths by a plume tard in the race last year and on top of that following its recent win down in tremor willie mullins is saying that the horse is in much better form this year than it was last year so he's a lot happier with the horse so that being the case a plume, um, album photo can't be too far away and probably at this stage is is probably not a bad each way bet at maybe 10 or 12 to 1 um to be in to be in the places yeah for me i'm actually looking at album photo as well really good value pick at this point um but ed you're looking for a bit of an outsider and you can just tell us about some of your previous history with anti-post betting on the gold cup you've had some success in the past am i right of a success i've had some uh, horses not make the gig uh, more often than not i've had a few pulled up but yeah no yeah we've all had um some some fun in the past on this year yeah cone degree was a nice one as, as a novice going back a few few years ago you probably see me jumping around on racing tv looking like an idiot um which is uh most nights out in shouting and when it when it comes to me to be honest with you but um no looking ahead of this like i think the apple child and galvin are the right two at the top of the market i i don't I disagree slightly with uh, Vincent. I think the ground will be a huge bearing on this Gold Cup, personally. Uh, I mean, there seems, again, there seems to be this kind of school of thought with the Elliott camp that Galvin doesn't want soft ground. I mean, he's a huge drifter for the Savile's chase because it absolutely lashed it down on the morning. But if anything, it helped him because it just brought his stamina right into play. I mean, he looked to be going nowhere two out. was going up and down on the spot, but he does stay this horse. I mean, we know that. He stayed over three miles, six furlongs to win at the festival previously. Uh, the Chatham Hill, he will devour. Uh, he's improving. He's unexposed. I just think it's one of those. I think if it's proper spring ground, we get 10 days of dry weather and dare I say it, having to water it just takes sting out of it. I think Rachel could use Apple Utah, who's naturally the quicker horse, and smuggle him into the race and come later. If it turns into a battle of wills, 
I'm definitely in the Galvin camp on soft ground. I think he, he will outstay them. So the one horse in here, I'm just saying, he's the a joker in the pack again, as I mm. use that expression in Enigma, because we surely we really don't know how good he is. His protector act for the Dan Scouter team. A lot of these other horses we've touched upon earlier have clashing form lines. They've beaten each other. We know where they are. And protector act, mm. we do not have a clue how good this horse is. He may not be any good at all. Uh, I mean, you, if you were going to take the collateral form literally, I mean, he, he, of the uh, entry run, he stumped Native River, who's since gone into retirement uh, pretty much afterwards. So the form in itself doesn't look anything spectacular. Nonetheless, the horse stepped up to three miles, one furlong on soft ground for the first time. He went absolutely head in chest. I mean, if this had been a Mullins horse or a Henderson horse, you know, tw- Black Smoke would have been billowing out of my Twitter app. Everyone had gone into absolute meltdown about it. I mean, it was a phenomenal performance. He pulled uh, Bridget Andrews' arms out for the first circuit, jumped lovely, and came home, as I said, absolutely hard held to win a grade two by 30 lengths. What, what that means of him, I don't know. It sounds like they might go Cotswold Chase or the Denman Chase over here uh, and kind of test the water again. But he's a... Whereas all the others have all clashed and have all had their battles, he's a fresh, unexposed type, uh, totally untapped potential over three miles, and he kind of sits outside that form line of the others, if you see what I'm saying. So he is a he's in the total unknown quantity. He's double figure price. Uh, he may not be up to this standard, but nonetheless, I'm I'd be shocked if we yet see the ceiling of his ability. So he's he's my kind of each way play uh, against the big guns. But I do totally respect those at the top of the market, and I think. Ground will be a, a huge factor in, the, in this Gold Cup. I mean, we barely mentioned Manella Indo, but very quick word on him. I just wonder if he's going a little bit sour. You know, they stuck the cheap pieces on. He dropped out very tamely at Kempton. For all the, you can bring, stop bringing excuses about the track didn't suit and ground and travel and everything. I mean, he was uh, entering the back straight. He was tailed off. And I just, you, you are pinning your hopes on the Cheltenham factor of him, which is, is totally plausible given his record at the venue. But uh, I do just wonder whether um, something's not quite right with Manella Rindo. And it will be a, be a wonderful training performance from Henry de Bromhead. Of course, he's a wonderful trainer if he, to get that horse back to win the Gold Cup again. But it's, yeah, protector app for me each way. Uh, fascinating, fascinating anti post market at present. Well, of course, yeah, we will be keeping tabs on how the market changes leading up to the festival. But now let's move on to this weekend where our team have got some tips for you from this weekend's racing. Now, unfortunately, every tip from last week was a loser, so we're not going to be dwelling too much on those. Uh, I just want to bring up Stephen Harris's top tips for this weekend. He's looking at Sandown, starting off with the 150. He's going to look at Grey Diamond to win at 13 to 2. And as we're moving on to the 3 o'clock, Dancing Shadow, which we mentioned before as well, 12 to 1 in that one. And then we move on to Hermes Boy in the 330. So yeah, plenty of value there. And of course, if you want to check out more of Stephen's selections, head on over to bettingexpert.com. But Ed, the floor is yours now for your tips for this weekend. What are your fancies? Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, should very just touch upon the only kind of graded race or race of real note this weekend, of course, is the Tolworth Hurdle, grade one, uh, where Constitution Hill, uh, mm. I imagine if he bolts up in that, as kind of odds suggest he will, he will go into favourite or very close to favouritism for the Supreme Novices in, in nine and a half weeks' time now. But um, yeah, in the 150, I'm going for Moonlighter, uh, for Nick Williams and Harry Cobden, eye-catching jockey booking here. Uh, this horse has been out of sorts of recent times, but unsuitably quick ground has not suited this horse at all. All his forms on soft to heavy. He's a course of distance winner uh, and off a mark of 141. He's now three pounds low in the last successful. Interesting. Uh, obviously, we don't have our resident Southwest uh, London weatherman with us uh, today, Stephen. But um, looking at the weather, there's a deluge of rain coming into Sandow on, on Saturday morning. Uh, they're forecasted up to 10 millimetres on Saturday morning with the ground already soft heavy in places on the hurdles track, riding a little bit quicker on the trace track. But bottom line is um, there won't be much of the word good flying around at Sandown on Saturday. That will suit Moonlighter down to the ground. He will absolutely love conditions. And I thought he could go well at a double figure price. And then over at Wincanton, uh, ground conditions a little bit better. Uh, this is kind of last roll of the dice of an old favourite here. But Slate House is a horse who, to be honest with you, could just be gone at the game now. He's looked really lacklustre in a couple of spins over hurdles. 
However, he's absolutely lobbed in off one, three, four over fences. Uh, I mean, he was a grade one winner at the Corto Star Novices going back a couple of years ago. I think he was up to one, five, seven or eight as his peak rating. He's down to one, three, four here. He was he was second in this race 12 months ago, off 16 pounds higher. He's one of the best. He's either the best handicapped horse this weekend or he's retiring. It's one of those two ways, whichever you're looking at. On paper, this is the easiest race he's run in. For, for about two years. Uh, I think Slate House around the six to one mark. If he doesn't run well here, uh, I think it could be um, bringing the curtain down on a, a decent career for him. So yeah, they're my two uh, tips for the weekend for a bit of value. Well, best of luck to you, Ed. And we're going over to Ireland as well for Vincent's fancies for this weekend. Vincent, over to you. Thanks, Jill. Well, first of all, if Ed is saying the best handicap horse of the weekend, there's a case for saying there's one in Fairy Hills and Sunday might be the one. Um, it's a quiet weekend in Ireland, to be honest, this weekend. We've got a minor meeting in Cork on Saturday and a minor enough meeting in Fairy Hills and Sunday. But uh, the first tip I was going for is a horse in the 150 at Fairy Hills and Sunday. It's in a handicap hurdle. We're, we're looking at freewheeling Dylan here. He's the Irish Grand National winner. He's actually thirty pounds lower over hurdles than he is over fences, so he's got he's got a fair bit in hand if he ever reproduces anything like his chase form. I don't know whether he will, but there's a there's a possibility he might in Fairy House where he's won a Grand National and obviously goes well enough around the course. Um, it's not a bad race. This you've got Martin Brattle's horse, Glen Quinn Castle. This is a JP McManus horse that's won seven handicaps in a row. Um, he's running off a, a hurdle rating of 117. His last hurdle win was off 103, so he's up 14 pounds for winning the neck the last day of hurdles. He's obviously a very progressive horse. Wouldn't say that he's reached his summit yet at 117, but at the same time, the likes of Freewheel and Dylan here, 30 pounds lower than his chase mark, is worth a little bit of a punt at what, what should be decent each way odds, I'd imagine. And then my second one was in the 250 race. It's a novice chase here. A horse of Willie Mullins is called El Barra. This horse finished second to a stable companion, Blue Lord, the last day over a similar horse in distance. That was over two miles. This is one furlong further. What's interesting about that race is he had a horse called Cad Boy, another J.P. McManus um, owned horse, was half a length behind in third that day. Obviously, Blue Lord won easily. Blue Lord has won again since over the Christmas. But what you had that day was El Barra drifted um, from three to one out to eight to one, while they plunged on Cad Boy nine to two into two to one. Even though Albaro was very weak in the betting that day, still finished a half a length in front of Cad Boy, the extra furling isn't going to make a whole lot of difference to either of them, realistically. So I'd be expecting Albaro to be the value here, presuming the two of them will turn up. It's not a bad little race. There's a couple of other ones in it here. Noel Mead has a decent horse that finished third to Fernie Hollow over fences. And then Willie Mullins has a horse that finished second in the Boodles handicap hurdle in Cheltenham last year. St. Sam is also among the entries. We haven't got declared runners yet, but presuming most of them turn up, I think Albara could be the value in that. Lovely stuff. Well, of course, best of luck to you, Vincent. I just want to clarify one thing with regards to Stephen's tip. It actually changed now for the 150 at Sandown. It is Gunsight Ridge to win two units on that, so taking on Ed's selection. But we'll be back, of course, next week to hopefully then recap some winners for you as well. So first of all, uh, well, lastly, Ed, Vincent, thanks a lot for your time. I'll be back again next week. So yeah, thanks a lot, guys. So thanks, Joe. No, cheers, Joe. See you soon. Great stuff. Now, of course, that wraps it up for today's edition of Jump To It. And if you do place a bet on any of our selections, please do gamble responsibly. Check out irishracing.com for all the cards and news going into this weekend's racing. We'll be back soon for another edition of Jump To It.